I'm Arlene Herson, and today we're going to meet a woman who could be described as a rebel with a cause, the cause women and how they feel about themselves. In her first book, Sex and the Single Girl, she may have shocked some women, but she opened the eyes of most who said, hey, it's okay for me to have feelings and live my life to the fullest. In her venture into publishing, she took a failing magazine and turned it into the magazine for women today. Don't we all secretly wish we were that cosmopolitan girl? In her recent book, Having It All, she shares with us how we too can have it all. She is the cosmopolitan woman who seems to have it all. She is Helen Gurley Brown. We'll meet her right after these messages, so please stay right there. Don't be a dummy. Ready! When your employees train with the National Guard and Reserve, they learn to be better team players, better decision makers, and better leaders. It's training that makes them better at serving our country, and better when they come back to work for you. Bill's back. Be a hero. Give your employees the freedom to protect ours. I'm Arlene Herson. We're with Helen Gurley Brown. We're here in her office in Cosmopolitan in New York. Thank you for having us right here in the midst of your busy day. You're nice to come over. Thank you. Oh, well, it's a, it's a privilege for me because I've been reading so much about you, learning so much about you, but as I mentioned, you're so much the cosmopolitan woman. You're so New York. It's so hard for me to believe that you really grew up in a tiny little town in Kansas. Arkansas. In Arkansas. Oh, okay. And well, we, I think <laughs> we Midwestern girls make the best New Yorkers because we're so wide-eyed and uh, so struck by the glamour and the excitement, and we really throw ourselves into it. And I think don't have any statistics, but a great many successful New York women came from the Midwest. Okay, but when you came from, when I said, the, and, and I said Kansas, because I knew it was Arkansas, and I also know it was in the Ozark Mountains, it was a little town called Green Forest. I mean, this is a mountain girl. This isn't just <laughs> the Midwest. This is, is really life as most people oh, in the city no. can't imagine. I sometimes think that people who start out with wonderfully advantaged childhoods and adolescences don't have a chance of succeeding because you don't have that spur, that, that fingernails in the flesh that I've got to get out of here, I've got to do something better than this, this is not the way I want to spend the rest of my life. And it is a tremendous motivator when you want more and better and different. And that little town in Arkansas is it's a wonderful place. They are fine people. A lot of my relatives are still there. But at a very early age, I figured it just it wasn't quite what I wanted. I needed something more, something different. So you dreamt about the possibility of getting out of there then. Did you think it would really be possible? You, you had such drive, even then? I'm afraid as a, as a child, I didn't have much to do with it. We moved to a big city, to, to Little Rock, which was a capital city. That was 100,000 people. And by comparison, that was very ritzy and uh, sophisticated. And after that, my, my mother took my sister and me to Los Angeles. So she got me out of the Ozarks. But if she hadn't, I think I would have got out anyway. Okay, but at that time, when you say your mother took you to Los Angeles, your father died when you were just 10 years old. Your mother, I read, you said, was not a very strong woman, and your sister was stricken with polio, crippled, mm -hmm. at a very mm -hmm. young age. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were, how did you cope then? Gosh, I guess it's, how did they cope with it? My sister has been in a wheelchair for 51 years, and usually people don't last that long. So when we say my mother wasn't very strong, she was strong enough to survive having no money and no 
means of supporting herself and then having her oldest child stricken with polio for which there was no cure in those days no prevention and lo these 50 years my darling sister has been in a wheelchair uh, immobilized from polio and I'm very close to her and I feel very uh, well I won't say fortunate that's not strong enough a word I, it shouldn't have happened to either of us but it could just as easily have happened to me so I'm very grateful that she's yeah. my sister and that she's put up such a fight I mean mostly people don't live that long when they are so immobilized true well I, I know that you helped support both your mother and sister but you always had we, when we mentioned the drive even in high school I read that you <laughs> were the top achiever that you achieved the the highest scholastic grade of any girl ever in your high school Arlene I think you use what you've got and in those days the only thing that mattered was beauty gorgeous glowy complexion beautiful blonde curls a nice curvy figure and if you didn't have those you might as well throw yourself into the Arkansas River because nothing else was really uh, a good substitute isn't that absurd brains were totally nowhere but since I didn't have the curvy figure or the blonde hair or the beautiful complexion I just used what I had which was a reasonably okay brain and that works for anybody anytime any place you just simply go with whatever modest assets you have and you sort of have to put the blinders on regarding what's happening to the other people that you'd like to be you know interesting when you refer to yourself in that way because in your book in, in all of your books and many of the things that I've read about you you keep saying I'm not beautiful and I'm not even pretty now that's obviously not true and uh, but it's something that obviously has bothered you over the years Still, Goodness. <laughs> doesn't, no, no, because I, you, you know, you didn't say it one time or two times, maybe ten times, different throughout having it all. In we're, the we're probing very, very <laughs> deeply, and, and I'm, I'm all for that. It doesn't bother me, but in Little Rock, at that particular time, you were supposed to be who? Lana Turner, Betty Grable, uh, Jean Harlow, and my mother never let up about pretty girls, and the pretty girls got everything and then ordinary girls didn't have such a good time and I really do think I was slightly brainwashed and you can't go on the rest of your life blaming anything on on your parents or on your mother that's the way she felt that uh, compared to Deanna Durbin or whoever the reigning queen was that, that I wasn't so wonderful so I did get it very firmly in mind plus my darling friend I've had my nose fixed and I've had my eyes done and I exercise and I do face exercises and at my age I probably look okay I think you look terrific I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay another thing just getting back because it's not really look you use a term in your book and and you refer to many people who would feel the same way you call yourself and women mouse burgers mm -hmm. why mouse burger a mouse burger is somebody who doesn't have everything going in you may not be a beauty which I certainly was not and still am not and you may not have a college education which I didn't your parents may be unprepossessing you have no money no background and you're in a sense mousy and you don't wind up being mousy the rest of your life but you start out as a so-called mousy person with very few prospects and I just lengthened that to call that person a mouse burger I think I stole that from somebody a girl in Los Angeles kept talking about men as being nothing burgers or jerk burgers and I just uh, borrowed the phrase and said that a girl like that was a mouse burger there are lots of mouse burgers in my opinion who are now quite glamorous women but they have gotten over their mousiness by using these qualities whatever they have everybody has some true and, and actually you point out how people can use all of those qualities whatever they have in in your book having it all uh, which started actually with uh, it's almost like a continuation of sex and the single girl only more advanced in today's world I don't want to sound like a bloody Pollyanna or somebody who is just la di da and it all worked out and one has no problems. Also, I don't want to sound as though something is just so easy that you can read a book and your life changes. My only credo, my only conviction really is that everyone has 
something that she or he is probably kind of good at or could be good at if she or he cultivated that one even a small asset and in my case I thought I would be a secretary forever and that's all right it's a wonderful field but the one thing that I could do was to write good letters and in those days there wasn't so much telephoning around so I wrote to my boss when he was out of town and I killed myself making him feel happy and popular and please come home we all need you and this is what's going on at the office I was a good letter writer plus anybody can do this I was on time and I was not late for lunch and I stayed a little bit late and those are very simple assets but some people are just too lazy or they want something grand and wonderful. They immediately want to be Sybil Shepherd or Mary Wells Lawrence, the advertising tycoon, or they want to be Catherine Graham, the owner of Newsweek and the Washington Post. My gosh, I mean, it takes a while to do those things, so you just use the tiniest thing that you can do to, to make a career out of it. Okay, well, too, well, you're talking about how you got out of being a secretary, but before you did, before you did, you had 17 secretarial positions mm -hmm. between the ages of 18 and 25. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break because obviously you're not a secretary. You, a lot of people get stuck in that rut. Um, you didn't, and uh, we're going to talk about more about what you did and didn't do after okay. we take this commercial break. We're speaking with Helen Gurley Brown. We're here in her office in Cosmopolitan. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay right there. Last year, thousands of innocent children were caught in the crossfire of violent crime. And it's not just the children who suffer. How much longer will you let this go on? Call this number now. We'll send you information on how you can protect your children from crime and drugs in your neighborhood. Together, we will take a bite out of crime. I'm Arlene Hurston. We're speaking with Helen Gurley Brown here in her office at Cosmopolitan. We were talking before the break, and you had mentioned uh, what happened to you after your secretarial jobs. You had had 18 secretarial jobs. You did advance to be a copywriter, as we mentioned. As a matter of fact, you won several awards in 1957, 58, and 59, I believe, for being a copywriter. No doubt you were successful in what you did, but you really came to public attention because of sex, because writing about sex in the single girl. That's what made Helen Gurley Brown a national known person. Now, do you feel that that book was the start of the sexual revolution? I think that would be giving that book a little bit too much credit. It was just a small, innocent little book. I didn't do tons of research. I researched with myself and with my friends, and I knew what we were doing. At that time, single women were not supposed to have a sex life. Now, that included about a third of the female population. And ever since eternity, since antiquity, women married single, whatever, uh, have sex lives. So we knew that that was happening, but nobody acknowledged such a thing. So by writing about it, just about what was happening to me and my friends, it sort of created a big whoop de do a big furor. And perhaps in that respect, it was considered revolutionary. But I didn't start anything. I was just reporting on what was already happening. OK, but that's what I meant. Because in those days, maybe lots of people were having sex. However, they were not talking about it. And that's, I think, what made the difference uh, in that you talked about it and you said, it's OK. As a matter of fact, there's a pillow right here. And it says, good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere. What's a bad girl? <laughs> well, a bad girl, in, in context of this pillow, and in my own uh, opinion, doesn't have anything to do with, with being uh, sexually active, if that's what she wants to do. Bad, in this sense, means that she has a little fun. She's not terribly, terribly fussy about whom she has a cup of coffee with. I think some women have to have an absolute prince before they can consider uh, fraternizing or sisterizing with this person. And bad just means that she's comfortable with men, she's not too uh, critical of men. So a bad girl is one that really kind of approves of men and has a good time. Okay, but you're not talking about just having a cup of coffee, you're talking about also not be too particular about the lovers that she has. 
And in today's world, today with the problem of AIDS, would you do anything differently? The books that you have written talk about being fairly free with sex, and people are and have been, but AIDS is a real problem now. How do you respond to that? AIDS is indeed a serious problem, and the seriousness of it has to do with it not being curable. That's horrendous and horrible, and all of us have lost friends, good friends. I, I can hardly count the, the associates that I have lost to that terrible plague. But there's some question about whether women are really as much at risk as everybody is saying that they are. I think there's a large segment of people who are not really comfortable with female sexuality. They feel that we just went too far, too fast, and we should get back home again and behave ourselves and stop having all that fun in bed. And I'm having an article written now in terms of how much risk there is for women sexually these days. There is some question whether a woman can even conceive, can get AIDS unless she's involved with an IV drug user uh, shooting up with needles and they might be contaminated or she's with a known bisexual. How does she know whether he's a bisexual? Well, maybe she can find out. She certainly knows whether he's a drug user. And if those two conditions are not present, a woman would have a hard time getting AIDS if there's no anal intercourse in her life. You have to get AIDS into the bloodstream before you can get it. And just regular vaginal intercourse, it probably is not going to happen. So, we'll okay. see. Well, that's encouraging, but you're talking about women. Can women give a man AIDS? I mean, you're talking about that, that women cannot get it as easily as we think. But, you know, is there a way for the man to protect himself? from the woman, or is that not as common a problem? I believe, statistically, there are very few men who have contracted AIDS from women. I'm not sure whether there's a single case or not. If a woman is an IV drug user, uh, she would be more apt to be contaminated. <laughs> but it's not the big whoop de doo thing for women that, it, that it's uh, cracked up to be. And I'm having my article checked by the head of every communicable disease department. Mostly they're afraid to take this stand because they want people to continue to be very careful. So we all have to check our statistics. <sighs> okay. Well, you were single for a long time. We mentioned you were married uh, when you were 37 years old. Now, in those days, you know, now women are getting married a lot later in life um, and having a lot more fun <laughs> in general because our life uh, has changed over the years. But when you were 37, you married and met David Brown, successful movie producer. What was it about you that you think appealed to him? I think what appealed to him is that I had just paid $5,000 in cash for a Mercedes-Benz sports car and his two previous wives never had 15 cents to buy a car to bobby pins with and he doesn't like my saying those things. I hope he never hears this. <laughs> Although he's got a book out, David Brown's Guide to Growing Gray, and he's out there talking about me right and left, so I get to mention that his two ex-wives were, if not profligate, they were they were not as solvent as this good little person who saved her salary and, and was not extravagant. So that appealed to him, Arlene, and he liked career women. There weren't so many career women then, especially in Beverly Hills, California. You were either an actress or you were the wife of a movie uh, executive, but you didn't work. So there I was in an ad agency bringing in all this money every week and well-employed and had a nice little brain. And uh, he liked that. Yeah, okay. Well, you were also, but you were very candid in your books, both of you. You mentioned uh, that he's written a book. Uh, David Brown, by the way, has gone on to be an extremely successful man, produced movies like The Sting, Cocoon, The Verdict, and the original Jaws. But you both write very candidly. I mean, in your books, you write about having been a kept woman. You write about many of your affairs. Um, he talks about how when you're older, not so bad to have uh, affairs. It's good for you. It keeps you younger. Now, you two seem to have a wonderful relationship, but how would you feel if your husband, David Brown, was having an affair? I would feel terrible, but I want to say two things. When we say kept woman, I was 25 years old, and it lasted a few months, and I wasn't very good at it at all because he was a raging anti-Semite, and I couldn't tell who was and who wasn't. I'm, I'm not Jewish, but <laughs> that was that's that deserves a whole book someday. So, kept woman sounds like Backstreet for year in and year out. I just gave it a whirl and couldn't bring it off because I was dumb. 
uh, if I'd been a really great kept girl, I probably would have been rich and, and uh, taken care of sooner. About affairs, Arlene, I don't think David or me ever has been pushing affairs for married people. He says, if I can explain for him, that you should keep women in your life, not necessarily for affairs, but don't stop being interested in women. Take them to lunch. My husband can go to lunch with anybody of the female persuasion. Uh, he has a couple of restaurants that I say are off limits because those are my restaurants. But lunch is okay. Dinner is out of the question. And if you were actually having an affair, I wouldn't like it at all. And uh, I don't know what I'd do. That's it, because you say one of your books, um, and I, you know, because I've read both of them, and I think it was in having it all, but I can't, could, could have been a sex and single girl. And you said, What's a single girl without a married man? Now that every, you know, it's okay to have, now that married man has to be married to somebody. What if it's your husband? I have a big double standard. My single girls, whom I'm always championing, in, I think it's all right. Well, at least you need a man in your life, and there are not enough men to go around. And at certain times in your life, you may be associated with somebody who already has a wife. I couldn't worry about her, even though I am a wife. That's her problem. That's his problem. So my single girls are something else. Married women, married women, I'm not pushing anybody to have an affair. I just say married women do, about 50% of them, according to our survey in Cosmo. More men than women have affairs. and. I hope it's not my husband. I know it's not me, but it's not the end of the world. Would you have an affair? I haven't. And the reason I haven't, I think, is because I had a lot of single life before I got married. Started dating when I was, what, 14? And I wasn't married until I was 37. So that's over mm. 20 years of having men, falling in love, having affairs if you want to. So when I married, I was able to say, OK, this is it. David had two previous wives. Uh, a few moments in between wives to have affairs, and we both sort of got that out of our system, I guess. Okay, but you've so. always been okay, you know. I mean, if you were, you, I don't think you'd tell me on television anyway, <laughs> but I, but I believe you. However, you both have been very, very supportive of each other. We have such a short time left, but you have done so much. I mean, he inspired you to write your first book, Sex and the Single Girl. Now, Cosmo, we're here at Cosmopolitan. You have done an incredible job. The magazine was really falling apart when you came, not very many advertisers. Now it's the magazine to read. Now you came in, no experience. You hadn't been an editor. You had 34 people or something like that waiting for leadership. Did you really crawl under David's desk that night and he found you there at 4 o'clock in the morning because you were terrified? Terrified. I was in a catatonic fit. But, Arlene, I was 43 years old and I had been working since I was 18. And however many years that is, I had been in offices, I had been working my tail off, I had been doing the best I knew how on each and every job. And finally, I got to be a pretty good well-paid copywriter in Los Angeles. Never had any employees of my own, but I was grounded in business. So when I came here, I had a little experience in the business world. Plus, I had David, who had edited magazines before and was able to help me. Plus, I got lucky. It turned out to be what I should do in life. It turned out I was going to be a good editor. And I never knew until I got here. An editor, and you just did your first print interview. Actually, you know, we have to talk. One of the things that was outstanding, outstanding, you had a lot of guts. The centerfold, Burt Reynolds. That centerfold was incredible. We're going to show part of it to our audience, but who had the idea, and how in the world did you talk him into it? I had the idea one Saturday. I was washing dishes or doing my nails or something. I just thought there always are pictures of naked women. Why don't we just show a naked man? It wasn't a boat from heaven or anything. It just occurred to me that we might do it. And as for Bert, if he had been any more famous, he wouldn't have done it, I think. He was just beginning to hit with a movie called Deliverance, and he was on The Tonight Show a lot. And if he had been any less famous, he wouldn't have been interesting to me. I wanted somebody who was well known. So it was just the right time in his life. Plus, he had a sense of humor. <laughs> it was the right time for both of you. I mean, that was incredible. And just recently, you did your first print interview with Elizabeth Taylor, um, who has become um, a role model. She looks wonderful. Your interview, by the way, was great. Uh, she's a role model for a lot of people, but you're a role model for a lot of people. We only have maybe 30 seconds left. Helen Gurley Brown editor of Cosmopolitan, wrote a book, Having It All. Do you have it all? 
I have the most that I could have hoped to get. I didn't want children, and I do have a nice man and a good job. But I'm going to say again that I get depressed, and I have bad days, and the only thing I know to do is one foot after the other. You say, well, what can I do to make this a little bit better, to get out of this morass, to get the next step along? There are no permanent solutions. You just learn to do what you got to do that particular day, and one thing leads to another. Oh, but something has to be there to motivate you to say, yeah. Naked fear, need, yearning, <laughs> wanting more than you already have. <gasps> okay, well, I've wanted to interview you, and I, I, I thank you for, for taking the time uh, to spend some time with us. We've been speaking with Helen Gurley Brown, and we'll be right back after these messages, so please don't go away. This is just one of the many parts you can play as a young Red Cross volunteer. Volunteer and play your part. My hero, Isaiah Thomas, Kevin Costner, Mr. Wong. These are teachers, but to the kids they've reached, they're heroes. My hero, Mrs. Wooten. If I don't get through to that child, who knows, maybe no one else will. Teachers have the power to wake up young minds, to be heroes, to make a difference. Reach for that power. Teach. Find out how by calling 1-800-45-TEACH. Be a teacher. Be a hero. <laughs> you made it! Hey, I couldn't have gotten through physics without you. Yeah, well, you're on your own at college. It's not fair. That's all right. I'm gonna get a job, you know. I'm gonna start working. I'm gonna save. And I'll be in college in another year or two. So, what are you having? Mike? I think we'll go home and make a sandwich. Okay. Support the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. I'm Arlene Herson, and I certainly hope that you've enjoyed spending time here at Helen Gurley Brown's office at Cosmopolitan. I know I did. She's been a woman who I have admired for a long time. Getting to know her, getting to read her book, Sex and the Single Girl, having it all, and uh, reading Cosmopolitan has made me an even bigger fan. I hope you're one, too. And I hope you'll join us again next week. Meantime, good night. Hope to see you then.